Welcome back to the Spy X Family Comparison Series, where we cover every single change between the manga and the anime. And boy, do we have an exciting episode to cover today, as we'll be running through the famed Dodgeball episode, which covers chapters 15 and Short Mission 4. What is Short Mission 4? Well, it's sort of like a mini chapter that takes place between chapters 27 and 28. Chapters that are very far ahead of the anime, but don't be scared, there's nothing displayed at this point that would be considered a spoiler, as it mainly just follows Henderson's morning routine, in which the anime alone even shows him salute the founder during his little jog. And once he's done with that, he gets cleaned up, puts in his magical floating monocle, and is off to the lounge for some tea time with a fellow teacher. During that time, they talk about Henderson's students and how one of them managed to get a tonitrous bolt faster than any other student in Eden College history. A far cry from their topic in the manga about how well his students did on a recent history exam. Literally none of that dialogue is present in the anime, and neither is the third teacher that walks into the lounge, as in the anime this happens to be the exact time that every single student in the building wakes up and some of them occupy that lounge instead. One of them being Damien, who's looking at his parentless orientation photo. This whole section of him and his lackeys talking about his home life is entirely anime exclusive and gives us a cursory glance at Damien's troubling family dynamic, as well as give us an early chance to hear that rumor about getting a Stella star during PE. A bit of foreshadowing for what chapter 15 will hold, but for now we'll move back into the Henderson-focused chapter, where he's currently reading about the history of Eden Academy, an anime-only book that he has some more time to read this time, since the part of him doing some elegant penmanship beforehand has been cut from the anime. Either way, this is just about exactly how I envisioned Henderson lives out day to day. But even the most meticulously crafted days do have its anomalies from time to time, especially when dealing with rowdy first graders. This is where that little six page extra mission ends, and it was a nice little introductory bit to the episode so that after the opening airs there can be a little more structure to the only other chapter this episode has to cover. That being said, it actually starts us off on page four, since this is the flash back where Lloyd gets the news about Anya possibly getting a Stella star. And since the anime doesn't really treat this scene as a flashback, the whole thing has been expanded upon. Which means right after Yor says they should start training, we'll continue this scene in anime-exclusive territory with the family talking about sports and killer moves and the like, as Anya declares that she will become the one and only star catch Anya. Some of the dialogue in this section does have a place in the manga, but we'll circle back to that in a bit. Anyways, since Lloyd decided to leave this training arc in the capable hands of Yor, she will be the one to teach Anya the ways of the ball, through jogging, image training, resistance band training, death-defying sit-ups, waterfall training, in the shower, as well as a little demonstration of what Anya should be capable of by the end, minus the superhuman strength part. And to celebrate Anya finishing her training, at the end of a stair climb they both do a rocky pose together while Anya literally reaches for the stars, triggering some awesome scene transitions that'll fast forward us to PE day, where Anya completes her transformation into star catch Anya. This is the sight that brings us back into manga territory, and back into the tension between between Anya and Damien. Come on guys, you're supposed to be on the same team here. Though I wouldn't blame the other students for not knowing that, as the anime interestingly removed their name and hall number on the back of their shirts. Names or not though, this game is about to get underway as both classes start getting lined up, and while this does happen in the manga, the shot the anime used is more akin to the foreshadowing illustration we skipped over back on page 2. The anime then goes on to adapt the title card illustration on page 3, where it looks like they've added a new challenger into the mix, a guy that Damien and his crew now seem to be more aware of ahead of time, thanks to the anime-only flashback of them researching the students from Class 4. It's only then that they got the stunning realization that they'll be up against one of the most hardcore first graders of all time. And he goes by the name of Bill Watkins, aka Bazooka Bill. Someone who's obviously six years old and shouldn't be married with a wife and a job. Since Damien's crew knew about this hormone-fueled child well in advance this time, they don't get nearly as shocked as they do in the manga, but it doesn't take long for that attitude to switch to panic after seeing a devastating four-way collateral shot that I don't even think most pro athletes could pull off. Nice little touch on how when Bill is targeting his opponents with that neat little hit marker graphic that the four kids he'll take out on the right stay highlighted throughout this cut, and that Becky is protecting Anya. And it's also nice to see that we're getting some really good panning and zoom work when it comes to these throws. It's the sort of thing you would expect from a show like Q. maybe because you can kind of see Bill being a character in that show. I can tell that the guy who directed and storyboarded this episode, Norihito Takahashi, Hashi had a lot of fun with this guy's character, because when we move back into anime-exclusive territory, he builds on Bill's character very well. The vibe of Bill as a young and jacked tactician is played upon superbly here, with how he's now presumably calculating wind resistance and air time. As for all this equipment Bill is using, this stuff is very cutting-edge for its era. The time period Spy Family takes place in is never outwardly stated,
dated, but based on the newspaper Twilight was reading in Chapter 1, it should be around the mid-1960s or so. So not only was the mouse just recently invented, but for the common consumer, this kind of processing power was pretty rare. Guess it really helps having connections with the military. Of course, it doesn't matter if he can't actually execute on his studies, but with that four-way collateral we just saw him do, as well as that peck-powered strike we'll see him do later on in the game, it's obvious that he already has all the traits of a seasoned veteran. Even still, though, he acts like a six-year-old when it matters. Hearing this grown-ass man that's voicing this kid say daddy will never cease to amuse me. But really, that's just the start of the fun screenplay this episode has to offer, because after we go back to the manga briefly to watch Becky getting taken out, some anime-only smack talk will ease us into another anime-only flashback of Damien and his crew relentlessly practicing their execution of anime-inspired dodgeball tactics. Whether it be a rock climbing exercise on the monkey bars, or a bout of endurance on Planet Namek, aka the tire swing. This purple ball that Damien grabs is quite the distinguished effect with how its colors were generated under the sporadic line work. It almost reminds me less of a Frieza-style attack and more like an extreme version of one of those plasma balls you play with as a kid. Not that those have a pulsating epicenter like this one does. Kids do tend to emulate what they see, one of the more popular ones being the Naruto run, but Damien's crew takes it a step further by incorporating what looks like a kosher ripoff of the Uzumaki barrage as well as the Shadow Clone Jutsu. They certainly look cool when doing this stuff, even if it is the least bit effective. After all, they're up against the prize definition of anime's suspension of disbelief, because Bill here can actually do a Shadow Clone attack. Or is it Shadow Shuriken at this point? Well, either way, it's an extremely deadly attack that had enough power to dent a white post when he practiced it earlier, so one of Damien's friends, who I'm just now learning is called Emil, decided to take one for the team and die a proud death protecting his leader. This part actually is in the manga, but it's much more straightforward and to the point, and doesn't house all the dramatics the anime has. Maybe because he got hit in his face this time. I thought face shots didn't count with Studio, what happened to that rule? Well, at the very least, they gave him a solid grieving process with his friend Ewan, who I'm also just now learning the name of before he gets taken out as well. Which is also something that does happen in the manga, but in that version he decided voluntarily to take the hit for Damien, a guy that really doesn't care to mourn like his crew does. Not the sort of person Anya wants to be friends with. Crazy how she's actually survived up to this point, but Bill here is about to realize that it might not be a fluke that she's held out this long, as she starts dodging every single pinpoint attack that was thrown her way. This guy just puts too much thought into his attacks. If he didn't, then this would have likely left this game up to a war of attrition, as it looks like just about nothing would have touched Anya. But unfortunately, after Henderson praises Anya's skills a little more in the anime, Anya gets tripped up when caught off guard by one of the out-of-bounds players, and her evasive stats drop down to zero. A major opening in the eyes of Bill, who at this point completely forgets the no-hits-to-the-face rule and sends another high-powered underhand shot Anya's way. It's a shot that Damien convinced himself he wouldn't bother with, but as we all know, Damien's thoughts are just a cover-up for how he truly feels about Anya. It's that tsundere response that has kept him safe from Anya's mind-reading prowess, but in moments like this, it's clear to even Anya that this kid might just be nicer than he seems. A great sacrificial deed, and one that spurred Anya to exercise the real fruits of her training. This is the one training flashback that is actually in the manga, but in there it mainly just houses the dialogue between Yor and Lloyd at the beginning of the episode about Yor's experience in sports. It doesn't show Yor demonstrating how to split a lake in half. It's once we go back to the current day that we get some additional tension building in the way of some new internal lines from Damien and Becky, as well as that sick panning shot around Anya. This cut, as well as the upcoming ones, I believe are done by Keisuke Okura, the same guy that did the big ball cuts from episode 5. His planning for his shots is really otherworldly, for this cut especially. There's just something about roaming camera work that finds its way into the symmetricity of a close-up shot that's just so satisfying to watch, especially when it's topped off with the classic gradual opening of big anime eyes. Now, I've said this plenty of times in other series, but these scenes are nothing without superb compositing, and it's very clear every other department pulled their weight here. Something I have mentioned a lot in this series, though, is how good the effect work in this show really is. It's just so sublime in how non-intrusive it is. Whether it's the trail the ball leaves behind, or the wind slash steam it puts off when someone throws or catches it, it's like an accent to the scene that never overpowers the cut itself, with low opacity and very quick dissipation. Wind is especially important when it comes to anime, after all, and seeing all this wind coming from Anya even gets Bill to back up a little bit this time, right before Anya initiates the real money shot of this episode. And let's talk about that shot a little bit, because it might just be the most impressive one this episode had to offer. It starts off simple enough with a top-down zoomed-in perspective of the dodgeball Anya's holding, but gradually the framing starts to move back while panning up to reach a close shot of Anya's face. 
It's after she swings her arm in front of the frame that the camera moves back to catch the extreme pose of her windup, as well as give more room for the background to start dissolving into the cosmos so that Anya can activate the hyperdrive and make all the stars around her blur as more star-shaped stars start to come in from the left. Maybe it's just me, but this whole sequence kind of has this Sailor Moon feel to it, especially when Anya fills up most of the frame again and the pink from her hair blends with the blue of the cosmos around her. It's those kind of harsh contrasts that were very prevalent in magical girl shows of old. Quite the spectacle for Bill to behold, but it's only right after his life flashes before his glasses does he realize that this attack was nothing more than an illusion powered by an overactive imagination. Anya's heart really was in the right place though, and that overwhelming aura really did have an effect on Bill, but that's just about all it was good for. Our team put up a good fight, but either way, this was a pointless match to begin with. No one was ever gonna get a Stella star here. Even if Damien knew that though, I don't think it would stop him from popping off on Anya for that whiff of the century. As it turns out, Chapter 15 ended in the same way Short Mission 4 did, with more insults flying around and Henderson harrowingly observing from a distance. Time to go back to training, Anya, and maybe get your dad to help you next time. This was one of those episodes that was very similar in form to Episode 5, and how childlike fantasies are put together in imaginative ways while still staying authentic to the source material. And maybe that's because both of these episodes were directed by Norihito Takahashi. He understood that none of this stuff was ever really high stakes to begin with, but that was never the point of these chapters anyway. It was just about kids being kids. The upcoming episode 11 does go back to a more rigid two-chapter adaptation process, but it's good to get switch-ups like this every now and then so that the animation talent can really shred its stuff. It keeps things fresh, especially for those who have already read the manga, and I applaud Wit Studio for that. They were generally supposed to be in charge of just the odd-numbered episodes, but they switched up the rollout just for this episode alone, meaning that Cloverworks' episode will be up next. It'll certainly be an interesting episode to cover, but for now this series will likely be put on hold for a while as I start covering other shows. Honestly, this series was originally meant to be a one-off, but after the success of the first video, I decided to keep going with it nearly two weeks later. Unfortunately, that means I fell behind, but who knows, with enough support, we might just get back to this series one day, and maybe even reach that doggo arc when it comes out in the fall season. But until then, I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you really did, then make sure to give the video a like, share it with a friend, and get subscribed with the bell on for more comparison content like this. For now though, I hope every single one of you has a fantastic day. And as always, this is Registry, signing off. Take care everyone.